Captain Midnight. This video is brought to you by Curiosity Stream. So Rick and Morty just wrapped up its fifth season with a pretty solid finale. While I wouldn't call it the best finale the show has ever done, it at least means that the last three episodes of what's been a pretty rocky season went out on a high note. The show has always had an interesting relationship with its own continuity and backstory. It loves to recontextualize its characters and hint at the specifics of those backstories while also kind of holding them at arm's length. Always careful to make sure that the show maintains its comedic engines first and foremost. It's a tough balance to pull off, and one that the show loves to poke fun at, with Rick constantly being exasperated that people want to know his backstory at all. But when the show leans into those elements, it does tend to result in some pretty great episodes. And that's just part of what I want to talk about this week. This episode starts out with a concept that we've seen plenty of times before, Rick and Morty getting so mad that they stop working together. I think it works well here, and it gives Morty more time to shine than he's often had this season. By that I don't mean that we've seen less of him on the show, just that the version that we have seen of him in season 5 is one that I'm increasingly tired of. The stupid teen whose horniness is constantly causing problems, in things like the evil sperm episode. Now this isn't to say that's an invalid take on the character, obviously Morty has been varying degrees of dumb and extremely horny since the pilot. But as the show goes on, I found that I like it most when they keep his character growth in mind, and these episodes do a great job of that. We see Morty using a portal gun to go from planet to planet, fixing Rick's messes all by himself. It doesn't seem like there's any real incentive for him to do this, it's just the right thing to do. Now Morty isn't always a good person, obviously, like one look back at the Purge episode can remind you of how brutal he can be when he's angry. But it seems like as time has gone on, he is becoming a lot more responsible and thinking about the impact that him and Rick have. Whether that's a transformation that'll last, or one that'll get tossed out immediately, I'm not sure, but I thought it was a great character note to include here. Morty gets another good moment when he lets a train rip off his own hand in order to do away with Nick. It's comically extreme, but it also gets across just how much Morty has changed since the start of the show. While he still does make mistakes, some in these very episodes, he's also a lot more self-assured and confident than he ever was before. But I guess I should also talk about Rick. In many ways, he's kind of at his lowest here. And by that I don't mean that it's the saddest or angriest that he's ever been, more that he seems less in control than ever. Turning over his entire life to teaming up with two crows in the never-ending crow war is pretty funny, and it gets at just how lost he is. Searching for purpose after being left alone once again at the end of the bird person episode. Not that the episode is all doom and gloom or anything, there's a lot of fun moments, even if I didn't think this one was quite as strong as that final episode. One moment that I did think really worked was Morty aging himself to try to guilt Rick into coming back. Not only has Rick apparently completely lost his ability to keep track of time, Morty also never thought to change out of his boyhood clothes when going to approach him. It's the kind of goofy gag that this show can always pull out of its hat well. This episode also seemed to touch on a portal gun fluid shortage, and I'm interested to see if that'll factor into the next season at all. Because if it does, I do think it might play really well into what I'm guessing season 6 will kind of be about, but I'll get to that in a minute. In the last episode, we go back to the Citadel, now run by President Morty. I like that the show doesn't even bother to hide that this is going to be Evil Morty, with Rick calling this out before their meal together even starts. In fact, I thought this whole stretch on the Citadel was some of the most funny stuff of the season. I especially love the gag where Rick gets really mad at President Morty's ham-fisted dialogue before he escapes and the dialogue gets even lazier. It's the sort of joke that really reminded me of like season 3 of Community. What this all ends up leading to is a lot of big revelations delivered back to back. In a long, dialogue-less sequence, we see Rick's memories, how a mysterious other Rick murdered Diane and young Beth, and how it wrecked his life. He eventually invented a portal gun that allowed him to murder Ricks throughout the universe, eventually killing tons of members of the Council of Ricks while they planned to take him out. Eventually, they made peace. He helped to build the Citadel and crash-landed back on Earth, moving in with an alternate version of the daughter that he never got to see grow up. 
Describing all of this out loud inevitably means having to say things like the Council of Ricks, which reminds you just how goofy this show is. At the end of the day, it is very obviously a comedy, but I think it also does a really good job of both acknowledging that and taking its characters seriously. Rick calls this his stupid crybaby backstory, annoyed that Morty even cares about it this much, which feels a lot like the writer speaking directly to the audience. But at the same time, the show clearly does care about this stuff. It impacts Rick deeply, and the show doesn't downplay that, giving us a memory sequence that's played very straight with no jokes. But that's really only half of it. Evil Morty, who I should probably just call Eyepatch Morty since I would argue he isn't purely evil at all, reveals the extent to which Rick, all Ricks, have shaped the entire universe of the show to their liking. The Ricks have not only treated Mortys like livestock to be used like an endless supply stream, they've also managed to separate themselves from any universe where Rick is not the smartest of all beings. They've carved out a corner of the cosmos for themselves that they can basically treat like a sandbox or, as Eyepatch Morty says, one infinite crib built around an infinite baby. Eyepatch Morty does some awful stuff, like murdering Ricks and Mortys in their tubes, but it's hard not to see his perspective on things pretty clearly and sympathize. He's never lived in a universe where Rick wasn't ultimately in control, and who could blame him for wanting to escape to one? Our Morty, touched by Rick's recent honesty, sticks by his grandpa, and together with a host of other Mortys, they make their escape in a great sequence that's set to another mournful cover of For the Damaged Quota by Blonde Redhead. What I like about this ending is just how many possibilities it sets up for next season. Now, has this season been rough in a lot of places? Definitely. But I still think there's a ton that season 6 is now able to play with. Rick, you did it again. Didn't you learn anything from last time? Oh, I, I, I thought you... Are you kidding? Rick and Morty's relationship seems like it would have to be at least a little bit different going forward. Maybe I'm wrong, and it won't be at all, but I think there's a big opportunity to change things up now, even as they still go on adventures together. Rick has been humbled, he's been outsmarted by a Morty, and our Morty knows more about him now than ever. It would make sense if next season found them on more equal footing. There's also the universe that I Patch Morty escaped to, that's outside of the bounds of what the Ricks had set up. That could introduce new characters that are actually smarter than Rick, and situations where he's not in control in the way we're used to seeing. Basically, I think season 6 could turn out to be the season where Rick is no longer a being of near godlike powers. One where he's often in over his head, and facing situations that he could have never seen coming. It seems like a way for Rick and Morty to refresh itself a bit, making the world of the show a bit more unpredictable for Rick. There's also the other Rick who killed his family, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like they never found him, or even know why he did what he did. Either way, this episode was a lot, so definitely tell me what you thought below. If you'd like to hear more of my thoughts on Rick and Morty, you're in luck. A Patreon video I made back in 2018, The Despair of Rick and Morty, has now been uploaded to Nebula and you can exclusively see it there. One of a few Nebula exclusives that I have. There's more on Rick and Morty, Cheers, and even Ang Lee's Hulk movie. And my stuff is just a drop in the bucket. There's also exclusive content from creators like H Bomber Guy, Nandu V Movies, and Lindsay Ellis. Nebula is the single best place to go to watch videos from creators that aren't beholden to YouTube's algorithm. Plus, you get it bundled with a great documentary streaming service, Curiosity Stream. This month, I checked out Becoming Martian, a really fun series about the history of our exploration and our love of the Red Planet. You combine history shows like that with Curiosity Streams documentaries on science, tech, and nature, and you have such a great offer. So when you sign up for Curiosity Stream, you'll receive an email welcoming you to Nebula as well. You can get all of this for $14.79 for an entire year. That's a 26% discount. So get the deal now by going to curiositystream.com slash Captain Midnight. That's curiositystream.com slash Captain Midnight. Here's a special tip for the fellas and girls who have not already joined Captain Midnight's new 1940 Flight Patrol. You'd better hurry up and join at once because there's a big adventure ahead. The thing to do now is to get started because we're going to have not only barrels of fun, but loads of free gifts and prizes too.